All right. Well, good evening, everybody. We are intimate and interactive, I guess, tonight. Glad that you are here. And we're going to start with a word of prayer and then jump right into things. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thanks for another opportunity to gather together to learn about you and your word and uh, about how we can impact uh, people in our community for Jesus Christ. So God, and direct our conversation, we pray. May you be glorified in it. In Jesus' name, amen. So as the screen says, look again tonight at what the difference is between biblical Christianity and Hinduism. And so as always, this is interactive. So raise your hands if you have questions or you don't understand something. Uh, we'll be asking you guys in the audience to participate in reading the scriptures. So be ready to jump on that. Hopefully you have your Bibles open and, or your devices open and turned on to different things. Uh, and so, like I said, we're talking about Hinduism tonight. We're going to get into it a little bit at the end of things uh, with uh, Sikhism, because there's, there's a connection between uh, Hinduism and Sikhs. Uh, and so, but most of our time, the majority of our time, will be spent on understanding Hinduism um, and the background of that. So, uh, most of you have probably uh, heard of this term here, right? Eastern mysticism. Oops, this, there we go. Is that hard to see? Oh, come on, Carmen. Is that better? No, that's not any better. <laughs> put put those back on. I'll change the I'll change the color. We'll uh, we'll do a different color then. I was all excited about green. No, I'm just kidding. I wasn't that excited about green. Um, that's the wrong button. There we go. So we'll turn it to blue. There we go. So. Uh, Eastern mysticism, again, this is where a lot of the, the Buddhism and Hinduism comes from, eastern part of the world, right? And so the world's kind of divided into western and, and eastern. Uh, and so this idea of eastern mysticism comes from um, the eastern part of the world. And one of the big things about eastern mysticism is this. Everything is this, temporary. Uh, i got to spell that right. There we go. Um, or Unreal. Uh, especially when it comes to our physical selves, our physical bodies, the physical world. It's all kind of a, 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 an illusion, if you will. Uh, it's not real. It's not uh, what the end of all things is all about. And so the physical universe, uh, it, this idea uh, is not rational, or, nor is it ordered to reveal God's glory, but it is actually a hindrance to experience the ultimate reality. So think about that for a second. We spend all of our days in our bodies, and then when you become one with whatever divine force is, which we'll get into in a moment or two, you're completely separated, never to return to a body again. Now, we know the Bible teaches us something different about that, which we'll be getting into in a few moments. But let's just talk about the creation and uh, God's view of it and why it's important. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 19. And we're going to be reading verses 1 to 4, which talk about God's creation. Now, interestingly enough, uh, I believe this statement to be accurate. If you take a look at every book of the Bible, with maybe the exception of Esther, it talks about God and God creating. And so there's no doubt in the authority of the Scriptures who has created things and why He has created them. Uh, God has done it. And so let's take a look at uh, Psalm 19. Somebody read that for us. Psalm 19, verses 1 to 4. Go for it. Excellent. So according to these verses, what do the heavens do? What does the earth do? What does the creation do? It declares the glory of God, right? And so there's a, already we're at odds with Eastern mysticism in the, in the scriptures because creation itself, there's a purpose behind it. It's not just unreal or temporary, but it is real. And it has a purpose, which is to declare the glory of God. The other thing... Uh, that Eastern mysticism teaches us is this, is that reality itself 
<clears throat> is attainable. By whom do you think it's attainable? Any guesses? Our selves. And you're going to see a, a very clear focus on the self versus on God. And really, Eastern mysticism is focused on self. Uh, and so, uh, part of Eastern mysticism is the self is divine or becomes a part of the divine. Uh, God is this impersonal force who has no, his, has no interest in people. So, again, you can see that uh, vast difference between the God of the Eastern mysticism, the God of Hinduism, which we'll get more specifically in, versus the God of the Bible. God is very personable. He wants relationship. He wants to know you and I, and he wants us to know him. Uh, and we see that most exemplified in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, right, who came to live amongst us, God with skin on, if you will. Um, and, uh, and so, again, these are kind of polar opposites just to begin. So that's kind of a summary of Eastern mysticism, uh, if you will, and brings us into more specifically uh, Hinduism and its origins. So, of the world religions that are out there, Hinduism is by, uh, considered by most to be the oldest. Uh, it, it, interesting, the name Hindu or Hinduism came from this river. Uh, hopefully you can see the connection there. The Indus or Hindu, maybe, river, uh, which uh, went through India. And uh, we have its beginnings in the third century, sorry, third millennial, oh, sorry, uh, B. See, so it's fairly fairly old in terms of different religions, and be, and it has very pagan origin, origins. So it began with a civilization known as the the Dravidians, is what they were called. Uh, so an ancient uh, civilization, and you're going to see the connections in a minute or two. So the Dravidians were a polytheistic fertility religion centering on the worship of nature and rituals. So little question for us today. What does this term mean? Any idea what polytheism means? Carmen, again? Yeah, it means many, simply many gods, yeah. And so this is the origin part of Hinduism. We'll get, it's, it's slightly different, though, than this polytheism, um, and we'll get there in a second. In about 2000 BC, the Dravidians were conquered by Aryan tribes, and polytheistic, those two polytheistic religions merged together uh, and their beliefs and all that kind of stuff. It was written down, and this is part of the uh, Hindu texts, if you will, uh, the religious text is written down in these texts here. Some of you may have heard of these before, the Vedas, the uh, Brahmas, I don't know if I'm spelling or pronouncing these right or not, but the Aryan Yokas and the Upanishads. And, and these are some of the uh, Hindu sacred writings or sacred texts that these polytheistic religions back in about 2000 BC began to write these things down and they continue to draw on those texts today. So, interestingly enough though, Hinduism is not um, polytheistic, it is this. Pantheistic. Anybody know what pantheism means or stands for? Any guesses? Not no God, but all is God. Everything is God. The chair you're sitting on is a God. The carpet you sit, you're walking on is a God. The dirt outside is a God. The cow is a dog. You're a God. The tree is a God. The river is God. Everything is a God. And you, you actually see this negatively affecting especially in India, because this is where it originated, uh, the caste system. Uh, and, and so you have the worship of, uh, especially in India, you have the worship of rats, and you have the worship of cows. So they can't eat cows, so there's a food source that's gone. And they allow rats, they can't kill rats. So they allow rats to just infest the place, because that might be, and we'll get to this in a second, that might be your great-great-great-great-grandmother, twice removed who has been reincarnated into a rat, and you don't want to kill the rat because then you've kind of killed yourself or something. I'm not sure how it all works. Anyways, it, it's sad to see because how it affects the lifestyle of the people, negatively 
uh, affects them, causes poverty and a cycle of poverty uh, over and over again. So um, here's one of the main teachings of Hinduism is this, God doesn't create anything. He didn't create the world. Um, <clears throat> Interestingly enough that God didn't create the world, but God is still the world because everything is God, and so everything in it is a God. This is kind of the, the thinking or the philosophy behind it. And so you see some of these terms that we have and are familiar with today come out of Hinduism. So we've probably all heard of this term, Mother Earth. Guess where that comes from? It dates all the way back to Eastern mysticism and Hinduism. You might have seen, uh, anybody seen this movie? Avatar, uh, it is rooted in Eastern mysticism, that whole concept of the earth itself being alive and worshiping the earth and all that kind of stuff, that comes straight from Eastern mysticism and Hinduism. Most of you probably are familiar with this movie. You know that one? And never heard of it. The concept of the force is straight from Eastern mysticism and Hinduism. Right? Everything becomes, once you die, you all become a part of this impersonal force type of thing that is out there. Um, and you become one with the divine, if you will, is this that concept. And so the mantra of Hinduism is this, all is one. All is one. So, you and I are, and you can, again, hear the connection between Avatar and Star Wars especially. We're one with nature. We're one with the universe. We're one with all living things. And all is one. One is all. That's the concept of Hinduism at its uh, root, if you will. So it gives us a little bit of the, the history of it, where it comes from. The goal of Hinduism, then, if all is one, the goal is to, any guesses, is to be... One, with the universe. It's to be one with the universe. Now, we know again from Scripture that humanity, the creation itself, is separate from God. Uh, where, where would you go in Scripture to, to say, okay, I, I want to teach this, uh, maybe I have a Hindu friend or something, and you want to go, hey, let's take a look at the Bible. Here's the Bible says about this concept that uh, we are not all one with the divine, but that we're distinct and separate from. Where would you go? Any guesses? Lots of places. Genesis. John 1.1. 1, 1. Right. So Genesis is a great place, right, where it just spells out in six days of creation how we are distinct and separate from the creation itself. Um, so that's a good one. John 1.1, 1, 1, right? Uh, or in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Uh, is another great one. And John 1 1 just is going to pop up in several of these uh, different talks over and over again, as is Genesis chapter 1. Of course, uh, let's take, take a look at our Bibles to Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. Because this is the root of the demonic nature, if you will, of Hinduism. And it comes straight from the fall of mankind and the deception that Satan put on Adam and Eve. So if somebody can read Genesis 3, verse 5. Okay. So the temptation there is to what? Be like God. Or one with God in this concept of, you know, kind of being one with the universe. That comes straight from Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. And the um, teachings of Hinduism come from the curse, if you will, or come from the fall. The goal of Hinduism is to be united uh, in this way. With what's called the Brahma. Oops. <clears throat> which is, the Brahma is what they, again, known as, it's the impersonal absolute. So think force, right? That kind of idea. Uh, and that's, that's the goal. And, and you get there, we're going to actually talk about how you get there through uh, Hindu um, caste system and through reincarnation and karma, all this kind of stuff. This is how you arrive at this 
Brahma. So that's kind of like their vision or version of heaven, if you will. You become, uh, heaven is this being come one with the impersonal force. Um, and, and it's not physical in any way. Because they, again, kind of abhor the idea of, of f- the physical nature, right? So suffering itself, which involves anything physical, um, suffering results from not liberating yourself from the physical world. And we're going to see how this plays out in karma and reincarnation, that whole cycle. The physical world uh, causes suffering. And uh, the, interestingly enough, the physical world is also, the, again, just a, an illusion called this, called maya. That's an illusion. So that term means. So again, the goal is to kind of divorce yourself from anything physical, become one with this impersonal force called the Brahma. So the true reality is the Brahma, and you're trying to free yourself from the physical world or transcend it to reach enlightenment. So that's this, again, that part of a goal is enlightenment where you reach Brahma. Questions so far? Making sense so far, hopefully? Well, that's a very good question, and we're going to get there in a moment because you'll see the caste system has a great deal to play in Hinduism. So great question. It's a good uh, uh, transition. Yes, Jim. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so I think history, hist- historians have, have been able to trace that to the Dravidians, where that, that polytheism kind of started this, and then those two tribes merged. And then out of that, then uh, in, mainly in India, right? And then it began to become part of the, the Indian religion, if you will, um, the main one. Now, it's, it's, it's a little distinct today or more separated today, uh, but still most Indians would be Hindus. Um, by birth, if you will, and born into that system. Yep. I don't know if they have those. So they, they've written the documents that I mentioned, a couple of them are the Vedas, the Brah- Brahmanians, or whatever it was called exactly. So they, that, that's some of their teachings. So some of the polytheistic teachings that they would have. Um, I, I, but history, I don't know. Uh, in my research, it didn't show that there's, okay, go to this book and you can see the history and trace, you know, kind of like Genesis, if you will. I don't know that they have that type of a document. So a good question. Okay, so this brings us to the caste system. And this is part of how Hinduism works. It works well in the caste system. And so you've got several different layers or levels, if you will, of the caste system. And... The problem with the caste system is this, is that you can never change from one level to the next on your own, okay? Um, So the first, uh, or the top of the system is the Brahmin, and these are the the priests and the kind of the social elite of uh, society, the priestly class. Uh, Then you've got uh, these people here, which are, oh boy, I don't know how to pronounce this, Kshatriyas. And these are uh, your fighters, your warriors, and your nobles. And then you've got the, uh, these people here, the Vaisyas. Okay, these are your uh, merchants class, so the sellers. And you've got underneath of them, you've got the Shudra, which equals a slave. And then underneath them, which are these people, the untouchables. And so Hinduism has created this whole caste system rooted in reincarnation. And so like I said, if you're born into an untouchable class, you have no hope of of rising to another caste. And untouchable is exactly like it says or suggests. These people are... Like a Brahmin person would have nothing to do with this, or nor would a Shudra or a Vesa or however you pronounce that, the nobles. Uh, they're the poorest of the poor. If you have ever been to India or seen scenes and you see the slums, if you will, this, these are the untouchables. This, these caste systems are still 
in, in play today. Uh, the, um, the United Nations has done, tried to do uh, some elimination of the untouchables, but it's, they're still there. And so again, there's this, this, there's this lack of this in here, in the, in the caste system. There's this huge lack of hope for the Indian, the person from India. I remember um, having a conversation with one of our friends from India that's, that's come here, sharing the gospel with him. And, and as soon as I mentioned to him about there not being any caste system in the Bible whatsoever, that we are equal in the eyes of God, you can see his eyes just go light right up. And really? Like that was his response. Because he has been taught from the moment that he was born that whatever caste he was in, he is not as worthy as so-and-so. Whether it's the Brahmin or whatever else. And that is just steeped in, uh, in Hinduism. And, and so um, we know that Scripture teaches us the exact opposite. That uh, people, no matter the color of their skin, no matter how tall or short they are, uh, no matter what they believe, we're, we're equal in the eyes of God. And so let's just go to some Scripture to prove that. Uh, if you have your Bibles, go to the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 28. Galatians 3.28. Many of you will probably be familiar with this verse. <clears throat> uh, read 28 and 29. Whoever's going to read that for us. So Galatians 3.28 and 29. So Paul in that passage is, is, is trying to argue the uh, no longer a need to uh, be circumcised uh, and saying that because we believe in Christ, whether no matter your heritage, we are one in Christ. But the point also can be taken that there's this equality. Um, and that kind of destroys the, the caste system, if you will, of, of, of the Hindu. Um, and so again, the only real hope that you have, and this goes to answer Carmen's question a little bit earlier, in, in your lifetime, so if Carmen, you're born as an untouchable, there's nothing you can do to change that. No matter, uh, you're not, you don't even have, so as an untouchable, you don't have access to education. You probably don't have access to clean water or good food. Uh, you, you have access to nothing, and there's nothing you can do to change that situation. So there's a fatalism involved in this as well. I'm just kind of stuck here. I'm just going to, you know, live my life and die and, and hope. And the holy hope that they have is this. It's reincarnation. The hope is that if I'm an untouchable, that I will then be able to re, be reincarnated if I'm good enough, and we'll get to more details in a moment. If I've lived this life good enough as an untouchable, that I might be reincarnated as a slave. And then same thing, each, each cast, right, goes up. I might be reincarnated the next person. And there's this cycle of, of really hopelessness, that just continues on indefinitely um, in, the, in the Hindu faith. So no real hope of salvation, no real hope of anything. And this is where we as Christians can come along and say, listen, there is hope. His name is Jesus. Uh, and, and pointing people to the hope that we have in Christ is huge for the Hindu. Questions or comments on that at the moment with the caste system? So, Jim, can I put that on pause for a second? Because we're going to come to that in just a moment. All right, so the question was about reincarnation. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, Okay, so I already talked a little bit about uh, the pantheist, uh, pantheistic aspect of it, but th again, this really affects the culture over there, um, that everything is God, uh, and the trees are, uh, you are, uh, we, we all are, cows are, everything is God. Of course, we know Scripture teaches us, again, the exact opposite. God alone is God, and this is, again, again the, uh, the lie of the enemy, straight from uh, the garden, and that he continues to try and convince people. We see that today, uh, in, even in our culture, in humanism. 
that you can, uh, you, will, you by yourself are God, right? You, you're your own authority. Uh, you can tell yourself what to do. Nobody can tell you what to do. This idea is in our culture. Um, and, and so it's, I guess, in a way, pantheistic, but also new agey. And we're going to, uh, new age has its roots in Hinduism. We're not going to spend time on, on new age, uh, but that's where it gets its roots from. This idea that everything is God. So again, a little bit of a question in terms of the uniqueness of God. Uh, where would you go in Scripture to show somebody the uniqueness of God? His holiness, his set-apartness, that he alone is God. What are some passages that you know of where we could go? Any suggestions there? Isaiah where? Do you, do you remember, Gwen? Isaiah 6. Yes. So let's go to Isaiah 6. So this is, again, talking about the holiness or set-apartness of God. So, Gwen, when you get that, why don't you read, uh, I think it's verses 1, 2. Excellent. Thanks, Gwen. A couple other suggestions, and we we took a look at this passage when we took a look at Judaism, but uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 6. Let's go to that next. This is what's known as Shema in Judaism, but it teaches us about the uniqueness or the oneness of God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, and read 4 through 6. Excellent. So, God is one. That's important. Not many or everything. Uh, just a couple of others we'll, we'll uh, go to in the New Testament. So, this is a good one. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. So, let's turn there. How many gods? One. There's one. Uh, and, and so, again, this is what Scripture teaches us. Uh, and, uh, again, um, God has made himself known. He's revealed us to, sorry, he's revealed himself to us as one, yet also Trinity, right? He is three in one. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We don't worship three gods. We worship one God in three persons. Uh, and we won't spend a whole lot of time on, on Trinity. Um, okay, so let's continue on here. So there is, again, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but um, we, the goal of, of Hinduism is to become one with nature, but also Hinduism is very impersonal. Your individual personality is destroyed. And so Hinduism teaches this, uh, that uh, there is... You know, God is, if, if there is a God, he is very impersonal. And you can't have a relationship with him. So again, there's that lack of hope, right? Uh, there's, there's no way to, to really reach God or, or have a relationship with him. Again, we'll, we'll come to it in a little bit. Just this endless cycle of karma and reincarnation. So this lack of hope, very impersonal God. Of course, Scripture teaches that God is very personal. He just defines his, the mo his most favorite name in the uh, Bible is Father. That's a very personal name, right? Uh, he wants to he, be a, a part of our family. He wants us to be part of his family, I should say. Uh, and, and we know that God is also love. So in the Hindu um, religion, there's no concept of God as love. None whatsoever. Where would you go in Scripture? I'm thinking New Testament. I'm thinking a book that John wrote that talks very specifically about God being love. 1 John 4, verse 7 and 8. Let's go there for a second. Let's 
Here's where John defines some of God's character for us. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. So where does love come from? It comes from God. Now, it doesn't come from us. It comes from God. Carmen? Yes. So Carmen's question is there's different ways of, uh, different words for love in, the, in Greek. Which one is this? Uh, so we're talking here about uh, Agape. Agape love is God's relational love. It's his sacrificial love. It's his loyal covenant type of love that we're talking about. When we're talking about relationship. Uh, so the other types of love are uh, brotherly love, right? Uh, there's um, sexual love. Uh, there's family love. Those are the other types of love the, the Greek talks about. But this is agape. Good question. So uh, Hinduism also teaches this. Uh, second, because uh, there's this impersonal force and everything is God, there really is no basis for morality. Our basis for morality is God. God has set the parameters. Uh, Ten Commandments are a good example, right? Don't do these things, do these things. This is part of the basis of our morality. Uh, and our, our Western culture has adopted some of that. Um, and some of those laws. Uh, but here's the thinking, and this is interesting. Um, I think it was uh, Ted Bundy, I think it was. It was, one, it was a mass serial killer who had bought into Hinduism. And he said this, this is his quote. He said, if all is one, what is bad or what is wrong? And really, that's the end result. If everything all ends up as one, and that's the kind of the goal. So, there's no difference between me loving you and between me killing you. Because the goal is one, to become one with this impersonal force. So if I kill you, I've actually done you a favor in Hinduism. Because now you're quicker through the reincarnation levels and hopefully have accessed this oneness. Of course, God says the exact opposite, right? Um, not good for us to kill one another. Uh, the third thing based... Uh, uh, kind of out of all this thinking is this, that you also have no free will whatsoever. And this goes back to the caste system. Uh, there's no free will or choice. It's very fatalistic. And so really fatalistic comes down to this idea of your subject to the fates or the willy-nillies of whatever God that you uh, uh, hold to. There's no changing of your uh, status you're just stuck in this lowest of lows, and that creates kind of a despair and a really lack of hope that we talked about earlier. So this is where we get into karma and reincarnation. One of my pet peeves as a pastor, and I'm going to hopefully none of you uh, get offended by this, but one of my pet peeves as a pastor is when I hear Christians talk about karma. We misunderstand the Maybe it's because of misunderstanding, or maybe it's just because we're naive. I don't know. But I hear this often from Christians. Oh, it's just karma. Well, karma removes God completely out of the picture and leaves it to faith. Um, and we have to be very careful as Christians that we're not just chalking things up to karma um, and, and just, oh, it just is what it is, right? No, God is in control. It takes out his sovereignty, it takes out his plan, and we just leave everything to karma. And so we've got to be very careful when we're talking just amongst ourselves, even maybe even joking, that we're not attributing things to, to demonic ideas, which what, is what karma is. It really is. It boils down to a very demonic idea. So it's a totally non-Christian ideology. It has this idea of cause and effect, Uh, and or merit and demerit. And so karma is rooted in what you did in your past life. So the reason why you're getting what you get in this life is all rooted in what you did in your past life. So it, karma and reincarnation are, are very intimately connected. So your past life affects this life. Uh, karma also teaches that our souls are uncreated, 
or eternal. And so karma is just this endless cycle that has gone on eternity past and will continue to go on throughout eternity. Uh, of course, we know that Scripture teaches the exact opposite. We have a beginning. We are not eternal. There's only one uncreated or one eternal one that is God himself. Everything else has been created from the heavenly beings to humans and everything in our world. Um, and so our soul has been created by God. We die once and then we're resurrected for judgment. So intimately linked to karma is, again, reincarnation. See if I can spell this right. There we go. So there's uh, reincarnation is this endless cycle of birth and rebirth. And what you're trying to do through these cycles is purge yourself of karma. You're trying to get rid of karma so then you can graduate to the next level. And eventually, once you graduate out of these endless cycles, you eventually reach uh, their version of heaven. So it's, it's really rooted in works, good works, earning your way to the next step. Of course, we know from Scripture, again, where would you go in Scripture? We've talked about this a couple times already, but a verse that would uh, address the lack of a need of good works to please God. Where would you go? Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9, right? It's how? By grace we are saved. Through faith, not by works, so no one can boast. So that's very important, and this is what Scripture teaches us. So uh, reincarnation all based on karma. Your good and bad deeds will determine how you come back in the next life. So if you're bad in this life, you might come back as an untouchable. You might come back as a cricket. Okay, you may come back as a plant. You may come back, fill in the blank, snail. I mean, all these things you could come back as. And, of course, that's a, that's a, a step down if you come back as a, as, a, as a snail or whatever or a tree. You want to keep stepping up in this whole system so that you can eventually reach enlightenment. And if you've uh, lived a, a bad life, like I said, you can come back as something not so nice. If you lived a good life, you come back as something nicer, or maybe in the next cast, if you will. Interestingly enough, the, uh, the concept of reincarnation initially began as a teaching called transmigration, which means that you could change from, uh, transmigration is changing from human to animal to plant to whatever else. Uh, that didn't sell in the, in the Western world. So the, then we, in the Western world, it became in, uh, known as reincarnation, where you can only change different uh, into humans, right? So you can only become a human again in your next life. You couldn't become a snail or a snake or whatever else. Uh, just really, they changed it to, to make it sell better. Gwen. That's a good question. So the question is, if they don't have a basis for morality, how do you determine uh, good or bad? It seems to me in my study, it's indeterminate. It's based on you, right? It's based on your understanding of, of this. And so we're, we're going to get into a little bit more in the next little bit um, when I flip my page. There is a, there is a, a way to earn your um, better life, better self, uh, if you will. Uh, but part of it is like, there, again, there's really no morality. So I can, if I feel I've lived a good life, well, I probably have even though I probably haven't. Um, but there are, there are ways in which you can earn yourself uh, the next level. Um, so I'm going to actually talk about that now. Good transition, Gwen. I like that. You guys are right on, right on task here. All right. Um, so this whole system of, of reincarnation and karma, which we've already talked about, really produces an extreme lack of hope. Um, but God is a God of hope. Uh, this is the God that we serve. This is the God of Scripture. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1, which talks about our hope. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, and we'll read to verse 5. So somebody can read that for us. 1 Peter 1, 3 to 5.
Yeah, excellent. Thank you. So we have the hope is rooted in the resurrection of Jesus, and our hope is imperishable. It's undefiled, unfading. It's kept in heaven, which is the exact opposite of reincarnation and karma. We know where we're going when we die. We have that assurance of, of eternal life in and through Jesus Christ. So, uh, Gwen, to answer your question a little bit more in detail. So they have this concept of, of what's called a moksha. And moksha is the release from the physical world and from the endless cycle of reincarnation. So the whole goal of reincarnation is to achieve moksha, where you've ended it and that's kind of enlightenment. And there's three paths to that. So path number one is what's called this. It's called the dharma, not dharma and Greg, in case you got that joke. Uh, and, and dharma is this. It's the path of works. So this is one way that you can earn the next level. It's, it's basically staying in your lane. So remember going back to the caste system? If you're a untouchable, hey, I, I, I go through this dharma stage by just kind of staying in my untouchable lane. I'm not going to complain about life. I'm not going to, you know, stir the pot. I'm not going to try to get to the next level on my own. I'm just going to stay in my lane. And that's one way I can get into this system uh, of getting out of reincarnation. I do this path of dharma or path of works where I just keep on going and I do enough good to get to the next level. That's kind of how that works. Path number two, we're going to spend a little bit of time on this one, is called this, the anana, anana which is a path of knowledge. So the path of knowledge is achieved by self-renunciation or asceticism. So living an ascetic lifestyle, basically it's asceticism is kind of beating your body, um, a lot of fasting involved in that, um, you know, a lot of giving up of you know, pleasures, if you will, of the world, uh, living that ascetic lifestyle. Meditation is a big part of this. Um, and the interesting thing about this path of knowledge is it's only open to the upper couple of castes. So the lower caste can't even have a hope of getting there this way. They have to do it the hard way, which is dharma, or the path of works. One of the big, and, and probably you'll all recognize this word, one of the big ways in which you achieve this path of knowledge is this, yoga. Yoga is steeped in Hinduism and Eastern mysticism. So I'm going to say this right up front so you all hopefully understand what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about stretching here, okay? Stretching is stretching. I'm talking about getting involved in the mysticism and the spirituality part of side of things, okay? So make sure we understand that. But as a Christian, if you're engaging in yoga, you should be very, very, very careful, okay? Again, nothing around stretching, but if you're involved, yoga has its roots in a spirituality. That spirituality is against God. So you just need to be very careful if you're involved in it. Um, I don't think, you know, stretching is of the devil, but I do think we have to be careful and we have to be wise uh, about what we participate in. So yoga has this uh, idea, this path of knowledge that you can transcend the world of illusion. So yoga actually means this, yoke or union with God. That is the hope of yoga. It's trying to get you unified with God. And it's an eight-step process. So if you're uh, looking at uh, yoga, uh, especially transcend transcendental yoga meditation, all that kind of stuff, the goal is to help you achieve liberation from the physical to enlightenment through these eight different steps. So I'll just spell out some of these steps for us. Uh, they're, they're summarized in steps one through five and then six to eight. So step uh, one through five is this. It's called Hatha Yoga. Hatha Yoga. And in Hatha Yoga, this is all uh, focuses on discipline and breathing. The idea is to detach from your mind. So that's the Eastern mysticism concept of meditation is this, is emptying your mind so that you can then achieve enlightenment or achieve the next level. The Bible also talks about meditation, doesn't it? But it talks about something else. So who can give me a good biblical definition of meditation? What is it? Any ideas? If Eastern mysticism is meditation is emptying your mind, what then could biblical meditation be? 
filling your mind with God's Word. That's right. So, yeah. Keep on going. No. <laughs> Good work. Yeah, so filling our minds with Scripture. So meditation, biblically, is, is memorizing some Scripture, and then through your day, it's you're chewing on it. You're going over it. You're meditating on it. Whereas Eastern mysticism, mysticism in the goal of yoga then is to clear your mind of all things and to achieve this nirvana enlightenment kind of idea. Um, again, not, I don't think there's anything wrong with being at peace. That's not what we're talking about, right? God is the God of peace, right? Um, it's not this idea of trying to, um, you know, uh, empty your mind of of anxious thoughts or that kind of stuff. No, it's just this this very spiritual connection that it's uh, trying to achieve. Uh, and then, um, yes, so the steps six through eight are called Raja Yoga. And in Raja Yoga, there's three things. There's concentration, which is... Uh, you're fixating on the divine, and oftentimes in this step, you have a mantra, and you repeat this mantra over and over and over again. Oftentimes, this mantra is linked with a Hindu god. Uh, and so again, this is why it's very, um, we have to be very careful as Christians to make sure we're not worshiping a, a, a god that is not Yahweh. Dave. Yeah. So Dave's question is, how do all the many gods fit in? And it's actually in path number three, which we'll get to in a moment. Thank you. Good question. I love this. You guys are just, oh, it's just transition. That's wonderful. <clears throat> but before we get there, we'll talk a little bit more about Raja Yoga. So there's that concentration, offering a mantra. There's meditation, which is this idea of oneness with the universe is achieved. And then the third step of, of Raja Yoga is called Samadhi. And this is where you're absorbed into the divine or, or where you transcend the physical and become one and enlightened. That's kind of the last step of, of yoga. So again, nothing wrong stretching, but just be very careful if you're involved in, in yoga. Because um, the ultimate, you know, again, if you trace it back to its origins, where it comes from, it's, it's very spiritual in, in, in uh, its creation and it's the worship of idols and, and uh, long story short, demons, right? So again, we got to be very careful. Okay, so this brings us to path number three of achieving enlightenment for the Buddha, or for the, not the Buddha, sorry, for the, for the Hindus. This path number three is called B-H-A-K-T-I, Bhakti. And this is where most people go to because it seems to be the easiest way. So um, the first step is just, it just seems to be hard to get to the next level uh, very difficult because you have to kind of stay in your own lane. The next level is, is highly steeped in yoga, and it's very ascetic and beating your body, and, and so it's difficult because you have to be very rigid in keeping this tight schedule of, of doing all the yoga stuff. The third one is a little easier um, because you have this pessimistic de uh, devotion to a god, uh, and this is Dave, hopefully will answer your question. You can choose one of this many gods, And there's 330 million gods. You can choose one of them, and if you're devoted to this god enough, then you can achieve the next level. That's how that works. Uh, now, some of the names of these gods, these are the more popular you probably have heard of. Anybody heard of Vishnu before? Some of you have. Some of you have heard of this one, Shiva. These are some of the, the more popular gods that a lot of Hindus will uh, spend their bhakti time trying to achieve the next level of reincarnation. Interestingly enough, you see the connection of both Vishnu and Shiva, two very pagan uh, idols. So Shiva is actually connected to the Canaanite fertility religion. Uh, and if you know anything about Canaanite, Canaanite fertility re, uh, uh, religions and stuff, they would basically, um, you, you appeased uh, uh, your god by having as much sex as possible with whoever you could. That's a fertility religion, essentially. And a lot of uh, 
pagan uh, prost- cult, cult or temple prostitution going on, all that kind of stuff. And so that, the god Shiva is connected to that. So we can see the pagan connections there. Uh, the god uh, Vishnu uh, has very uh, different names uh, across uh, Hinduism. But this idea, this idea of, of, of a savior, um, interesting enough, he takes the form of a giant turtle. So we know the form of a giant turtle also in native spirituality. Um, and he takes the form of Buddha as well. Uh, so Vishnu is connected with Buddha. And of course, if you know anything about Buddhism, you know it's steeped in Hinduism. So we're going to talk about Buddhism more spe- specifically next week. But you just can see the connection uh, there as well. So ultimately, this concept of uh, Hinduism kind of boils down to this. All is this, all is one. And the idea of all is one has led to this belief, and it's crept into our Western world as well, that all religions are equally valid, equally true, equally worth pursuing. So for the Hindu person, they could say, oh, Jesus is fine to worship, along with Vishnu, Shiva, and 330 other million gods, the carpet, rats, etc., etc., your ancestor, everything and everything is God, right? So if all is one, that really means that nobody is really God. Everything is God. So that's why they can say, hey, it's okay if you're Buddhist. It's okay if you're Islamic. It's okay if you're, you know, like Jesus. We can lump you all in and everything is, is one. Of course, you see this belief coming out. Um, and we talked about it a little bit before, I think, last week in this whole mantra of coexist. Uh, Oprah teaches this. Steve Harvey teaches this. These are some famous names that would, would, would believe the same thing, that all paths lead to God, not just one. Of course, we know there's only one path, don't we? And his name is Jesus. So John 14, 6, a very good example of that. Christianity is very exclusive. It says there's only one way to get to God. It's through Jesus Christ. Um, he is the way, the truth, and the life. John 10, 1 to 4, talks about Jesus being the door the gate, the good shepherd. He alone is the way, and there is no other. Matthew 7, 13 to 14, we looked at this last week, where it talks about there's a broad road that leads to destruction. There's a narrow road that leads to life, and get on the narrow road. Make sure the narrow road, of course, is Christ and belief in him. All right. Um, so, Dave, did I answer your question? Ish? <laughs> Hopefully. Go ahead. Go ahead. That is a very good question. So Gwen's question is, if, if Hindus seem to be very tolerant and all is one, why is there so much uh, persecution against Christians? Yep. Absolutely. It is. Yeah, it's happening today. So, I, I, again, I've talked to some of our Indian friends, and so it depends on where you live in the country. The further north you get, the worse it is for Christians. So, the further south you get, the better it is. So, our Malayalam friends, they can worship fairly freely in the southern part of India. But if you worship Jesus in the northern part of India, you're taking your life in your hands, uh, essentially. Uh, and so, part of that is because there's uh, Islam, is there? Part of that is. Um, and, and so Islam, we know, is, is fairly militant against Christianity. Part of that, and I, I don't know if I have a, a really good answer other than it's a spiritual battle that we're facing. And you see the deception in Hinduism where it comes across as this religion that is peaceful and accepting, but it's the exact opposite of that uh, when it comes especially to Christianity. Karm. That's a good point. Carmen's point was Christianity is trying to destroy the caste system. Uh, I wouldn't say it's trying to, but it does, just because of this equality that Christ brings, right? And so, again, there is no... If you take someone who is the elite of the elite and tell them, well, you're on the par with the untouchable, that's going to set some 
hairs on end, right? Uh, and get people upset. So that's a, a good point. So, I, but I'm not sure if I have a better answer than that. But that's caste system probably has a part to play in that uh, as well. And so, yeah, you would you would see like if an untouchable, even in, within the caste system, right? If you see an untouchable trying to do something, trying to rise to a, a Brahmin or something, there would be there would be violence probably even within the caste system. Um, and so, outside of that, even so. Um, or, or, um, yeah. Um, I want to touch a little bit. I, I forgot about this part. I'm sorry. I meant to talk a little bit more about reincarnation just so we can wrap our heads around it a little bit more. Um, when it comes to comparing reincarnation to Scripture, reincarnation denies a few things. It denies this. It denies a uh, personal God. I did not spell deny well there. Um, or maybe I did. I think, I think that's right. Uh, it denies this. Reincarnation denies the atonement. The atonement, of course, is the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, where he sacrificially and substitutionarily took our place. That's, that's what the atonement is all about. That Christ has died in our place, taken our place. And if you continue to have this cycle of reincarnation over and over again, you can't really have Jesus dying and then coming back as himself. He'd come back as somebody else. Uh, and so, therefore, it, it, it denies the atonement. Of course, it also denies resurrection in a couple of different places. It denies Jesus' resurrection. And it denies who else's resurrection? Our resurrection. You, you, it denies resurrection completely. Um, and then the, the final thing, uh, that this is, I guess, is number five. It denies this idea of judgment. That the Bible very clearly teaches. So let's go to a couple of, of verses, just that kind of, uh, what's the lack of a better term, um, fights against this idea of reincarnation and where we could bring people to uh, to help them understand that reincarnation is just not a reality, that you have one life to live, and that is it. So a couple of verses that we're going to take a look at um, that would help us in this regard. John 11, 25 to 26. So I'm going to assign a couple of people to read these because there's a few of them. Um, so uh, hopefully you have your Bibles, and if I assign you and you don't have one, look on with somebody else. I am volunteering you. All right. So Steve Tillman, John 11, 25, 26. Roger, 2 Corinthians 5, 8. And Brian, Philippians 1, 21. There's one on the, on the back table there, Steve, over at Welcome Center, if you need, if you need it. <clears throat> so these are some, oh, actually one more. I forgot about this one. And Janus, Hebrews 9.27. So why don't we start with Hebrews 9.27 while Steve is finding his Bible there. So Janus, if you got that, read Hebrews 9.27 for us. Nine twenty seven, Hebrews nine twenty seven. Okay, pretty clear there, isn't it? I mean, kind of destroys reincarnation in one verse. So you, you die once, you live once, you die once, then you face judgment. Uh, and so that destroys this idea of reincarnation right there. Who is Philippians one twenty one? Okay, so the concept of living for Jesus, living this life, not to gain the next level, but we live it for Christ. And then our death is gained because we are then immediately with Christ. We're absent from the body. We're present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5.8. Who's reading that one again? Excellent. I forgot that's what that said, but good work. Roger. And then Steve, John 11, 25-26. So Jesus is obviously talking about 
the second death. We do physically die, but there's life after death. And again, not this cycle of repetition, but immediately ushered into that reality of, of uh, being with Jesus. So these are just a couple of verses that we could go to to, to kind of debunk uh, reincarnation and, and talk to our, our Hindu friends about that. So one of the other question is, okay, well, what do they believe about Jesus? Who is Jesus to the Hindu? Well, interestingly, they believe that Vishnu is a, the incarnation of a god, not Jesus. So again, incarnation means taking on flesh, right? Being a, being a person, right? Like Jesus took on flesh. That means he was incarnated. Uh, of course, the Bible tells us the exact opposite. John chapter 1, verse 14 is a perfect example of that, where it talks about how Jesus took on flesh, um, and he tabernacled or dwelt amongst us. Um, so Jesus alone is the incarnation. He, there is no other incarnation of God taking on flesh. It's Christ alone. They also teach this, which we've already touched on before. They teach that there's many paths to salvation. We, we touched on three of them already that we, we spoke about just briefly. Um, but of course, John 14, 6, Jesus is the only path to salvation. There's not many, but there is one. Uh, how about this one? Everyone is a God. Everyone's a God. The Bible tells us that we are not gods, but that there is one God, and he is shown to us through Jesus Christ. Um, did we look up? Oh, no, we haven't. Let's look up 1 Peter 2, 24. 1 Peter 2, 24. Which helps us understand the salvation that we have in and through Jesus and him alone. So somebody read 1 Peter 2, 24. Right. So again, we cannot earn our own salvation, right? It's only through Jesus that our sins are dealt with, which deals with, which then kind of brings us to this idea of their concept of sin. They believe sin is an illusion. It, it's, it's what you make up, if you will, and that you can achieve salvation on your own through devotion, meditation, good works, and self-control. That's how you achieve salvation, not by a personal faith in Jesus, but you can earn it, you can work at it, you can get there on your own. However, you're going to spend a bazillion lifetimes doing it through this reincarnation karma aspect over and over and over and over again. Let's look at one more verse. This helps us again wrap our heads around the uniqueness of Jesus in Romans chapter 3, 23 and 24. Some of you should have Romans 3, 23 committed to memory, but you might not have 24 committed to memory. So Romans chapter 3, 23 to 24. Okay, so sin is not an illusion according to this. We've all committed it, and the only way out of that is through being justified by the grace that God has given to us through Jesus Christ. Yes, go ahead, Glenn. It is. Yeah, Glenn's comment just about reincarnation, losing family members, and, and how you may never, you don't have any concept of, of seeing them again or hope of seeing them again. You really don't. Again, it just goes to this lack of, of just hope that is all throughout this, this religious system.
Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it, true, true enough, right? And, and that's, again, why um, you see the, the, the Hindu person being very careful around insects or, you know, whatever, because they might be, you know, eating ant so-and-so or whatever it is, um, taking this new form. Um, so very, yeah, it's very sad to see and then very lacking of hope. Um, uh, my, while you were talking about that, my mind went to one of the, my, my kids' uh, cartoons that we have watched. Um, Moana, anybody seen Moana? For Moana, right? And so Hinduism is in there, right? Because grandma comes back as this um, manta ray and, and vi- revisits her later on, right? This is her, her grandma taking this new form. And that's the same kind of concept that Hinduism teaches, that you're just taking a different form and, and a higher form, and you have no idea who, where, or what you might become next. So, good, yeah, good point, Quinn. Just want to talk uh, briefly at, at the end of our discussion here um, about some of the other religions that have been birthed by Hinduism. We've already talked about Buddhism. Uh, comes directly uh, from Hinduism, and it takes a, a different, a slightly different shape, but, but similar. Uh, Harry Krishna, some of you have heard about that. I'm not going to spend time on Harry Krishna stuff. New Age. And then this one, which is kind of important for, for our context, which we talked about earlier, right, is Sikhism. There's a similarity, but also a difference. And so it comes, uh, a Hindu individual started Sikhism. And I, I'm only going to spend about five minutes on this, but just to help us understand, because we have a lot of Indian people, a lot of Sikhs in our, in our city. So understanding a little bit about them. So Sikhism arose with this concept in mind. It was trying to harmonize Hinduism and Islam. So in India, like I said earlier, you've got Islam and you've got Hinduism. And Sikhism was was trying to be a happy bridge or medium between the two of them. Uh, And so this guy, which is kind of their their main teacher, and it's, you know, lack of a better term, this is their Jesus, if you will, uh, Guru Nanak, who lived... Uh, 1469 to 1538. He's their main guru, main teacher. So anytime you talk about gurus, the guru concept comes from Sikhs. That's where that that terminology comes from. And so uh, this guru Nanak is their founder. He believed that he received a direct call from God as a guru. And so then his teachings formed the concept of, of what we know as Sikhism today. Of course, you'll notice that Mr. Guru Nanak has this. He is dead. Uh, you can go visit his grave if you so choose, which doesn't put him on par anywhere close to Jesus, who was alive. Uh, he was born in, in, uh, in the main uh, area of India where Sikhism exists is Punjab, the province of Punjab. Um, and it's the Punjab region. So, again, we have a number of students that I've interacted with at our food bank and at church. They are Hindu, uh, not just Hindus, but they're also Sikhs. So there's a little bit of both. Some, some are Hindus, some are Sikhs. And so one of the main teachings that are similar to Christianity, there are some similarities and some differences between Hinduism, is this, is that they believe that God is one. So God is not many. That's a big difference, right? So it is a mon- essentially a monotheistic religion, whereas Hinduism, God is everywhere, God is all, and in Sikhism, God is one. Um, and but they've they've also have a name for him, which is not the God of the Bible. We know that's very clear. This is the the name of the God of Sikhism, Sat Nam, or Ek On Kar. I don't know what those names mean, but that's just what, what they're, they're calling him. Even though they believe in one God, they believe that God is in no way, shape, or form personal. So this is where the concept of uh, connects with Hinduism, right? Very impersonal God. He's very abstract. Uh, in Sikhism, you still have reincarnation and karma, very prevalent. Um, this is really interesting and also sad at the same time, right? In the Sikh religion, you have 8.4 million forms of life to travel through before you reach 
enlightenment or what they call their enlightenment, which is this. Wa Heg Guru. 8.4 million forms that you need to go through in reincarnation. That is a, a lot, to say the least. Again, what does that lack? It lacks hope. It lacks any com real concept of an afterlife. Um, and certainly not with a personal God who loves you, cares for you, and sent his son Jesus to die for you. So, so very abstract God that you really can't get to know. Some of the other teachings of Sikhism, they do not, uh, they say this, Jesus is not God. Um, he's really only a saint or a guru. Saint slash guru. So in other words, like a lot of religions uh, teach that Jesus is a good teacher, nothing more. Essentially that's what Sikh is, Sikhs believe about Jesus. He's a good guy, got some good teachings, but he's nothing more. He's certainly not God. Even though we know that Jesus, and we've looked at this before, several claims in the New Testament, Jesus himself de uh, declared himself to be God. Um, and, you, you know, one of the things that you could talk to about a Hindu person, along with anybody who doesn't believe that Jesus is God and is a good teacher, is this, is, is the, the hypothesis of C.S. Lewis. If Jesus is not Lord, then he's a liar or he's a lunatic. And that means he's not a good guy at all. So you should throw out his teachings. If he's a liar because he's claimed to be God, we can show that, verifiably his claims. Or he's a lunatic because he thinks he's God and he's not, right? And we have uh, God delusions even in our own society where we recognize that people claim to be God and they're not. They have this God delusion. They're mentally unwell, which means he's not a good guy to follow, right? And so we can have that conversation with a Hindu person, with a Sikh person, or with anybody who believes that Jesus isn't God. A couple other things about uh, Sikhism is this. Their, their scriptures, again, just like uh, Christians, they believe that their scriptures are theirs and theirs alone. It's the truth, and, and nothing else is true. Uh, I don't know the name. I couldn't find the, uh, in my brief research, I couldn't find the name of their scriptures. I'm not sure what it is. Um, but again, uh, this this is very prevalent in, in Sikhism. Um they reject the atonement of God, but it comes back to, reject the atonement of Jesus, but it all comes back to karma. So many of our Sikh and Hindu friends, they are looking to do this. They're looking to do good deeds. We see this, I run across this in our food bank often. So not only are they looking to help out because it's required by immigration, but it's also required by their religion. Um, they're seeking, if I can do enough good then I get enough karma and good karma, and then I'm, I'm processing up the chain, if you will. Um, one of their main teachings in Sikhism is performing acts of service. So that, that, there's nothing wrong with performing acts of service. We would teach the same thing. Jesus does, right? So nothing wrong with doing acts of service and helping out the community. The problem is, is if you're doing those to earn your salvation. And so that's a clear distinction between uh, Christianity and Sikhism. So... If you were to go to a Sikh temple, and I've, I've, I haven't been there myself, but I've been told this by Sikhs, you go to a Sikh temple, there is no worship service. You're there, you go there, you eat some food, and you're, you're being served. That's essentially what a Sikh religious experience is all about, is them serving you. Why? So that they can earn the next step in karma, if you will. Another uh, way in which they earn salvation, if you will, is by fighting what they call the five evils. Um, I, I didn't write down what those are, but pride is probably one of them, right? So, again, you're, you're, you're working your way, performing enough good, not doing bad to earn your salvation. So it gives you a little bit of a taste of, of Sikhism, um, where it comes from. It has some of its connections with Hinduism, but it's also a completely separate religion. So a Sikh is not a Hindu. A Hindu is not a Sikh. Um, you probably offend them greatly if you associate the two of them together. Um, but its goal, its, its goal came out of trying to bring peace between Islam and Hinduism. And interestingly enough, if you know anything about Hinduism or Islam, as Gwen mentioned earlier, there is no real avenue for peace uh, in those two religions. Um, like we talked about Islam last week, uh, Islam is known as the religion of the sword. 
It, 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 it spreads by conquering people with violence. It still does that today in jihad uh, and other, other forms. Um, and then, of course, Hinduism, which we just talked about, persecutes especially Christians as well. So any other comments or questions? Uh, that brings it, That's an end of my notes for tonight. Hopefully that has brought some enlightenment to you. No pun intended when I talked about enlightenment. Did Jim get his question answered? What was your question again, Jim? Do you remember what it was? Yay! Mm. Yeah, and then those three other things that we talked about, yoga being one of them, worshiping one of the 330 million gods well, and then uh, I forget what the, th the first one was. But yeah, so good. I'm glad I answered that question. Thanks, Quinn. So Gwen's comment was just about the, uh, <laughs> a lot, yes. I, I'll do my best to summarize that, but basically the tensions between Canada and India right now uh, based on um, some of the things that we've been seeing in our politics and accusations being out. And then, um, anyways, it's good to know what seeks belief, I think is what her point was. All right, so any other questions or comments uh, tonight? If, uh, if not, I'll close in a word of prayer, and then we can be on our way. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth that is in Jesus Christ, and that we can have a hope because you are a God of hope. You give us a life everlasting through Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we rub shoulders with uh, maybe students from India, whether that's at Walmart or whether that's at Northern College or whether that's here at church, Lord, that we would be able to present the hope that we have in Jesus, that they would grab a hold of that and trust in you, repent, and turn and, turn and follow Jesus. So, Lord, the gospel is still good, and it's still full of hope for the Hindu and for the Sikh and for everybody else that we're talking about, and it is for us too. So Lord, keep us humble, we pray, and keep us focused on you. In Jesus' name, amen.